Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm very happy to say on this webinar on applying for an ERC grant, uh, perspectives from grantees and evaluators. Uh, we have registrants from every continent. Uh, we are the North America hub of your access. So obviously a lot of our audience tends to be based in uh, the US and Canada, as well as in Europe. Uh, but I hope we have a similar turnout uh, today where we have every continent represented. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce your access services and then we'll jump right into hearing from our two great speakers. Uh, so those of you that are already members of your access or familiar with your access, uh, you're, you're welcome to go get your, your morning cup of coffee, depending on where you are, since you will have heard this before. Uh, but other than that, I'll just give very express remarks about uh, what your access services are. Uh, and then from there, I do encourage you during the two speakers portions uh, to submit any questions you might have for them about the, uh, less about eligibility, but more so about the perspectives from the uh, panel reviewers, uh, panel evaluators, and the grantee perspective. Uh, so I'm going to quickly share my screen here. And we'll jump right into this. So again, thank you uh, for coming here. Good, very early morning to, to some of you uh, and good afternoon to those of you uh, further ahead in the time zones. Uh, I'm Jackson Howard with Your Access North America. I'm representing uh, the North America hub of the Euraxis project overall. So Euraxis Researchers in Motion uh, is the overarching initiative of the European Commission to promote Europe as a research destination. Uh, so similarly this week, all the other hubs of Euraxis outside of Europe uh, are holding similar ERC webinars. We're actually following up two months to the day from our September 16th webinar where we introduced uh, from ERC uh, staff members uh, how to apply and, and the application process itself. So I'll be sending a follow-up email tomorrow to everyone about that, with a link to that recording so that you can familiarize yourself with that as well if you're interested in applying uh, next year. So briefly, your Access Researchers in Motion is the pan-European initiative of the European Research Area or ERA. Uh, that's the Unified Research Area of EU member states and associated countries, which are uh, the, not the 27 EU member states only, but those neighboring countries that also pay into the budget uh, for research and innovation. So this is a single borderless market for research, innovation, and technology uh, across the EU with the aim of enabling free circulation of researchers, scientific knowledge, uh, and technology. And I think our speakers here also reflect the, the global nature of this. Uh, so as one of the many tools to achieve this goal, your access is backed by the European Union uh, and then those member states and associated country uh, for the purpose of supporting research and mobility and career development. Uh, so all of our services are free. Please continue to be in touch with us after the webinar. We'll, we'll help you uh, wherever you're based in North America and our colleagues in Europe and in other parts of the world uh, will also be here for you. Uh, again, I'll give you a very quick overview of what we do. So our bread and butter is our Your Access portal that has a jobs and funding database. This is where as a researcher, you're invited to, <clears throat> to search for job vacancies and funding opportunities. Uh, and then research institutions and universities and companies uh, can publish their own job vacancies. These are monitored by your access staff. So you basically know that everything posted is been given the green light and is legitimate. Uh, and these also pull from existing uh, fund job boards and funding boards uh, in Europe. So it really is a one-stop shop if you're looking. Uh, registered users can use the partnering tool and hosting tool. So you can find institutions that are looking for researchers and publishing hosting offers. Uh, we also do career development. So now during the pandemic, this is through webinars, training webinars, uh, and interactive sessions. We also take your feedback and your suggestions. So if you have uh, things you think we can do, programs we can help design to help fit your needs, uh, send us an email and we'll be happy to, to talk further. Um, and then information and assistance. Sometimes you may have a very specific question about wanting to move to country X in Europe and you wanna know what the childcare situation or tax uh, situation is like in that country. Uh, and those of us in the Your Access hubs outside of Europe may not have national level expertise. In that case, every country in Europe has your access uh, offices and service centers. Uh, so there's 42 national portals where you simply choose the country and our, our colleagues and counterparts uh, in that country with your access can answer those questions for you. Uh, again, as I said, we are speaking to you today from your access North America. We are under the umbrella of your access worldwide, uh, which is the presence of your access project outside of, of Europe. So we are your networking tool, supporting you as a researcher working outside of Europe, regardless of your nationality, uh, to help you connect or to help you stay connected to Europe. So this is just a quick screenshot of the website to get you familiar with uh, the interface. If you see in the very top left, that's the home icon. If you get started there simply by saying what you are, let's say a researcher and you're looking for funding, you can select those two options in the drop-down menu. Uh, and from there, it'll take you to 
for example, the job board and, and funding uh, search page. So please do visit your access.org, uh, put in any information, sort of self descriptors like that, and it'll take you to the relevant parts of the website. And then these stats are correct as of last night. Uh, we have a lot of registered researchers there either looking for partners. Uh, many of them have uploaded their CVs as well in sort of a standard format called the Europass format, uh, which will help help it be seen more easily by, by employers and by universities and by organizations. Uh, and then organizations themselves also register. And then finally, closing off with a, a website screenshot, uh, the jobs and funding, like I said, is one of the main uh, purposes people, people visit. Uh, there's a lot of rich keywords you can use to filter down. So out of tens of thousands of, of simultaneous offers that are live at any given moment, uh, you will be able to say, for example, oh, only show me uh, opportunities that are funded through ERC grants uh, or Maurice Kodoska Cree grants, something like that. And you can narrow it down to specific countries. I had previously mentioned the Euraxis uh, national portals. Uh, here's an example. So these are the uh, 27 EU member states and Horizon 2020 associated countries. You can contact our counterparts in these countries to get country level uh, expertise in 18 different topics that are divided into three categories. I'm happy to, to speak at this more at length if you send me an email uh, after the webinar, but basically uh, they've all divvied up these, what are cons consistently 18 categories uh, that anyone moving to a new country for the first time uh, or establishing him or herself in a new country might want to ask. Uh, but as a busy researcher, you don't have the time to necessarily investigate all of these in detail. So they'll share this information with you. So closing out, uh, we are again, your Access North America. What do we do and how we do it? We have our virtual events like this. Uh, we have European scientific diasporas that we help network and, and connect uh, with here in North America. So European uh, scientist researchers uh, in the US and Canada. Uh, we do have that annual meeting coming up on December 10th. Uh, so I'll be happy to follow up with information there if you reach out to me. We have quarterly newsletters. Uh, we have bi-monthly flash notes where we give information on European uh, funding opportunities. And then again, uh, webinars and eventually uh, back to in-person events where we'll have research uh, career uh, development training and things like that. So I mentioned one of our upcoming events. Uh, one is that's approaching next week is our European Research Days. Uh, this will be a two-day online event about uh, European and Canadian uh, funding sources, bringing together uh, speakers from different funding programs uh, within the European Commission, uh, including the ERC, which we'll hear a lot about today, uh, and the Canadian government as well. Uh, so regardless of which country you're based in, uh, if you're interested in Europe in one way or another as, as a research uh, option, I would really encourage you to sign up now for the European Research Days. Uh, I've been asking you to get in touch with me if you want to discuss further. Uh, so again, I'm Jackson Howard with your Access North America. I'm the regional representative. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., covering Canada and the U.S., uh, and you can reach my colleague, Dr. Daria Butanir, Karajan and I at North America at Euraxis.net. Uh, so before briefly introducing uh, our next speaker, you should see their bios on the, the event webpage. I'll just give a very quick introduction to ERC grants uh, as a whole while they give more specific, specific perspectives. Uh, it's important to notice the three research domains here, the life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering, and then finally, social sciences and humanities. Uh, today, both speakers tend to come from the, the third research domain listed here. And I think it's really important to underscore that uh, the social sciences humanities are equally included, and it's not only for the hard sciences, so to say. Uh, so any excellent research the, the commission wants to support through the ERC, uh, Again, this is the audience here is expected to be from any and every research field. Uh, it's just very nice that today we'll get some perspectives from uh, perhaps a, one of the research domains that doesn't get uh, the same amount of attention. Uh, so in our webinar two months ago, you would have gotten a brief introduction to the funding schemes. So I'll quickly leave this up here for you to review, but you can see that through the starting grant uh, for those with two to seven uh, years of research experience since PhD completion, uh, that's what a lot of people, when you registered, you said you were interested in. Uh, during the optional registration questions. Uh, from there, there's the consolidator grant option, um, advanced grant and synergy grant. Uh, I'll briefly mention that there's also proof of concept grants. Uh, if you've already received an ERC grant, which I think applies to a small number of you in the audience uh, for your frontier research project and how you wanna explore the commercial or societal potential of your work. Um, and then there's also opportunities to join existing ERC funded teams through what are called implementing arrangements. Uh, and these are bilateral agreements which exist with uh, Canada and the European Union, as well as the US and the European Union. Uh, so in addition to these grants that are listed, that's an option too. Um, this ERC support and opportunities include startup funding for those moving to Europe. Um, and you can also, as a grantee, keep your affiliation with your home institution outside of Europe. 
uh, I would direct a lot of you to our webinar two months ago to explain uh, the benefits to, to researchers who are coming from outside of ERA, the European Research Area. Uh, area. Uh, and finally, the ERC website and national contact points in the different European countries uh, where you're potentially interested in moving to, uh, we'll have a lot of expertise from you. But from there, I'll keep my remarks very brief um, and I'll introduce our speakers. So first and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Ray Siemens, an ERC grant panel member uh, who is at the University of Victoria uh, for giving his perspective uh, being an evaluator. So I'll stop sharing my screen here and I'll mute myself and I'll ask Ray to share his remarks. Great, thanks very much, Jackson. And uh, thank you all for, um, for inviting me to be a part of this really um, important uh, panel. Um, I'm giving the perspective of an evaluator and a panel chair uh, across several different uh, types of grants. Um, my domain area, as Jackson alluded to, is in the social science and humanities. Um, particularly, the majority of the work I've had the pleasure of doing with ERC has been around what's called SH5, which is cultural and cultural production. And the knowledge domains there are literature, philology, cultural studies, arts, and philosophy. Um, I served a number of years ago as a panel member for the starting grants, moving to Consolidator as a panel member, and last year in the year coming up, I'll be panel chair for the Consolidator in that area. But I review widely across the humanities and social sciences uh, into information science and computer science, and so have a sense of other domain areas there too. And I think I intend at least a number of my comments to be based in my experience, but maybe speak more broadly than social science and humanities exclusively now. One sec here. So overall, you know, this type of experience that I've had suggests to me that ultimate success, and I think we're all interested in, in success if we're putting in uh, applications to these sorts of funding uh, vehicles, ultimate success is found across a few contexts and understanding the context may be beneficial. So I'll speak to them. Um, these are things that are high level and detail oriented alike. Um, that those evaluating applications are asked to consider as part of the process. And basically it falls into two main categories. One is, as you're considering the research that you're hoping to propose, is to understand it in the context of the ERC mission, situating your work within the scope of the mission. And the second is, I think, understanding how best to articulate that proposed research and past work in the frame of the ERC's application process. So again, speaking across programs generally in that way, but also with some specifics that I hope will be valuable. So the first context I mentioned is the ERC mission. Um, you will have encountered this in, in other materials. I'll speak briefly. Firstly, it's to encourage high quality research, the highest quality research in Europe through competitive funding on to support via that means investigator driven frontier research across all fields on the basis of excellence. So this approach is investigator driven or bottom up in nature. And the belief is that, and I think it's an accurate belief, it allows researchers to identify new opportunities and directions in any field of research. And it ensures that support for those initiatives uh, are, are channeled based on um, curiosity driven, investigator driven imperative. Funds are awarded through open competition to projects headed and started by established uh, and starting researchers uh, working, as we've said before, uh, in or moving to Europe. And the sole criterion is excellent. The aim is to recognize the best ideas and more broadly to bring about those best ideas in the contexts of new, unpredictable, scientific, social, technological discoveries of the kind that can be informative to new industries, to new markets broader social innovations of the future. Now, I suggested this in the way that I have because it really is a very specific mission and it differs from other sorts of funding bodies and agencies and research support groups that we might encounter. Oh, and just taking a look at the chat, my, my apologies. I'm just gonna speak from notes. Uh, I, I hope that's okay, but I'm happy to share notes later if people would like. So again, very, very specific mission of the ERC. And in that mission, difference from a number of other types of funding and support bodies. Much research fits into this mission, but much valuable research may fit better elsewhere. And I would add to that, you know, a fair bit of my own work uh, would, would not fit 
the ERC mandate as such, but, but does fit a number of other research support groups that I, I belong to and work with. Let me give an example of some valuable research that might not be a good fit with this sort of mission. Um, one is top-down research work that perhaps has responded to various governmental, institutional, or corporate incentives and direction. Of course, there's a role for this sort of research support and research that answers that kind of, um, that kind of uh, uh, incentivization, but um, that is not part of the ERC's mission. Um, another type of research um, is what I call sort of first step uh, grassroots foundational research, small scale, basic proof of concept work, or big ideas that are still in development that might more typically be funded via smaller scale institutional, regional, or even some national programs. Research that really does work towards bigger ideas and bigger picture focus, but is still at uh, um, an initial scale, establishing a foundation, but not yet building on a foundation. Uh, and another, I might say, is, is work that's at state of the art. Not advancing state of the art, but at state of the art. Valuable work that advances important fields well, but might not be at the cutting edge, or to go back to, to earlier vocabulary, not at the frontier. And this isn't criticism of the work itself. It's excellent work. Um, but it just isn't aligned with the mission of the ERC as a funder. And I'd like to say here again, you know, much of the work I do is situated there, possibly at state of the art, but not all of it is advancing state of the art. Not all of it is frontier within the ERC definition. Lots of value there, but keeping in mind that fit is really important. So again, in sum on this particular part of things, the fit with the ERC mission, investigator driven research, that identifies new opportunities and new research directions and does so in new and promising areas. Second, frontier research, new and potentially unpredictable scientific and technical discoveries, the kind that are the basis for significant innovation and advancement across industry, market, social spheres. And lastly, the evaluation criteria, excellence. That's quantified across all the materials that are suggested as part of the application and reflected not only in the sort of guidance you will receive for whichever program you might be applying to, but also in those programs, evaluative criteria. And it's because of that, that I'd like to move now to the second context for, for my talk, which is in and around the evaluative criteria, looking at the demands of the application and talking about how that manifests in well, what, what I as an evaluator, a reviewer, as a panel chair would be thinking of. So that notion of excellence is manifest in criteria for evaluation across the two criteria areas of the typical ERC application. And one is the research project itself and how you articulate the, uh, the proposed project, what it will do, how it will fit, how it will advance those aims. And the other is based on past research as reflected in primary investigator or principal comment or accomplishments on a CV. General considerations across both these sets of materials um, are fairly straightforward to articulate, but I think very important to articulate as well. In responding to the application specific needs, all the materials need to be, first of all, concise, readily accessible. They need to be clear and readily understandable. And what I mean by this is ideally right from the project acronym, the longer title of the project and its higher level abstract, evaluators, reviewers need to understand um, clearly and concisely what the project is about. And having been involved in a number of discussions about very wonderful projects, um, it is clear that those with the most readily understandable sense of what it is and why it's important and how it will be done and how it fits in the larger ERC mission, even from that acronym, very, very, very strong and compelling argumentative uh, uh, advantage. In addition to being concise and clear, um, applications need to be well organized and readily navigable not massive blocks of text. 
not massive blocks of text, but actually being able to be readable, jumping in at various points, coming out at other points, well-organized, readily navigable. That means that it's got to have clearly articulated and appropriately flagged research questions, formulated research objectives, reflection of these things in the work packages or other explicit planning uh, mechanisms indicated in the application that reflect a feasible approach for the research of areas of responsibility across a team, pertinent outputs that feed not only into demonstrating the impact and, and the breadth and depth of the, uh, the value of the research across community or communities, um, but also beyond and into budget justification, good use of resources. All these things have to be not only clearly and concisely conveyed, but they need to be well organized and easily navigable in the application materials. Now, adding to this, and maybe summarizing as well, in essence, the application itself and the way it's presented needs to be focused explicitly on documenting how the proposed research is pertinent in the context of the application's specific needs and how what is requested and outlined in the application supports that application's evaluation criteria. But one thing I might add to that as well is in bringing together application materials, it's really important in many cases to be aware that you're speaking to more than one audience. In many ways, the chief audience you're speaking to are experts in your domain, disciplinary and subdisciplinary experts who will be specialist reviewers um, and likely though not exclusively, some or, or maybe all panelists. But there's another group worth considering too as you're situating the way in which you articulate your application and its research, its proposed research. And that's, you could be speaking also to a larger group or a group of larger area generalists, people who might know the specifics of your particularly knowledge domain, but might come from an adjacent knowledge domain or one further afield than adjacent. They could be possibly interdisciplinarians. They could reflect sub subdomain expertise and that's why they are part of your review process. Now, in some panels, this is uh, a, a group that makes up the majority. For example, in SH5, which is a very broadly dispersed uh, knowledge domain panel. In other panels, you'll be more likely to have disciplinary and subdisciplinary experts exclusively reviewing your material. Those who are writing applications will know their research best, they will know their areas of endeavor best, and they will know their audiences best, but I raise this just to be uh, helpful in that larger sphere. Disciplinary and subdisciplinaries have their own standards, practices and protocols, even of expression of research and how it's documented. Um, those are embedded in the foundational areas of, uh, of endeavor that, that you and other applicants will reflect. But keeping an eye on this will ensure that you're reaching the broadest possible audience of reviewers, of panel members, and of those who are evaluating you beyond. Talking about the research project, one of two areas of evaluation. The focus here is presenting proposed research in the clearly articulated areas of the evaluative criteria. And that breaks down to one, the groundbreaking nature and potential impact of the research project and two, scientific approach. Of that first part, there are a series of evaluative questions that guide research evaluation here. Um, one of them is to what extent does the proposed research address important challenges? One of the easiest ways to ensure that your audience, your reviewers and your panelists understand that is to be very explicit and upfront how your research fits into the scope, what the research questions are, what the objectives are, and how it fits in this larger area of evaluation, addressing important challenges. Important challenges can be discipline specific, and, and most often they are, but they can also have positive reflection in other disciplinary areas. So something that happens in discipline X informs discipline Y, and may even reflect quite positively in society at large or a larger social culture, larger appropriate, broader contexts. And if that's the case, it's really important to, to document the full extent of, of how you feel your research addresses important challenges in those contexts. Another evaluative question is to what extent are the objectives ambitious and beyond state of the art, such as novel concepts and approaches or development between or across disciplines. Um, 
here and following that, that echo of scope and articulation that I just mentioned a moment ago, this can be largely uh, about what is most ambitious in your work. Understanding not only what the state of the art of the field is or fields that you hope to impact, but being able to articulate very clearly how it goes beyond. What's novel often requires specific address and argument. And by that, I mean rhetorical positioning for specialists and area generalists alike. Um, no time to be shy. This is a really good opportunity to situate that, that work in its most ambitious, most, <clears throat> excuse me, um, novel context. And the third of the evaluative questions about groundbreaking nature and potential impact uh, that reviewers uh, work with is to what extent the proposed research is high risk, high gain. That is, if it's successful, the payoffs will be significant, but there might be a high risk associated with that type of research. If so, does it produce other valuable contributions to science? So echoing further some of the con contributions that I've already brought to, to, to attention, you know, this is really frontier research. Uh, and its potential for high, high gain is also understood to be mediated and balanced with an understanding of risk involved. Highly ranked applications I've noticed over time typically both articulate potential high, broad and transformative gain in ways I've already mentioned, but they also point out an experienced understanding from the perspective of the applicant's field or fields of expertise of the potential risks involved. That is, they, they understand gain and risk being somehow connected and mediate risk, mediate risk with appropriate strategies to ensure that it is minimized. So articulating the gains in the context of risk can be very important and understanding that even the most ambitious programs of research, if they don't reach and fulfill the projected uh, trajectory and, and goals, Understanding what the contributions made by that research along the way are really important as well to document, not as a main focus, of course, of the research itself, but in a section that really acknowledges the expertise of reward and risk in this context and the ability to mediate. Um, I should note that many, many disciplines across uh, all areas of academic endeavor understand failure as a necessary step on the way to success. And so being able to document that can be very important. Um, in terms of scientific approach, uh, another section of the research evaluation, the, the type of evaluative question typically goes like this. To what extent is the outlined scientific approach feasible, bearing in mind the extent that the proposed research is high risk, high gain? Building on what I've mentioned before, in the best cases, Scientific approach is articulated in the context of the discipline, of course. Even when the researcher or the research seeks to advance method and approach, it does require a clear, organized address. Even in what's visible at stage one of the applications, a number of applications are staged. You want to ensure that it's in both sections. You have to be aware of what evaluators are seeing at this stage when you consider where to document your scientific approach most clearly and be sure that your, your reviewers have access to as much pertinent information as they need at both stages of evaluation and adjudication so that they can have a clear sense of your methodological foundations, your, liter your, your uh, literature review, as they call in some disciplines, and how that ultimately informs your success. And again, if you're going to be working in methodological or um, advance and scientific approach. Make that as clear as possible too, and make it clear which domains, even beyond your specific domain, may be informed by that. I have just about five minutes left, and in those five minutes I want to talk about the second aspect of the application criteria, and that's the principal investigator and how principal investigators are represented uh, in the application by an extended CV and application-oriented criteria that are fairly explicit. Um, in, in some other research cultures, um, many of which are probably reflected by, by those who are listening to, to me talk, this criteria is sometimes also called researcher track record. And it's called that because it looks at the foundation and past research, past training, 
past publication, past community building and networking, past projects. It, it looks at all that in the context of likelihood of success in the research that's being proposed. Typical positive narratives here that exist across these materials and reviewers respond well to focus on how the proposed research builds on past research success or failure that's led to success, even across smaller, more foundational proof of concept projects outside of the ERC mission that might come together in the current application to align with the frontier uh, research associated with ERC. This is the place to document your past experience and success in that specific context. The basic evaluative criteria for those who are involved in the reviewer process are fairly clear. Um, we're asked to evaluate uh, demonstrated ability to conduct groundbreaking research. We're asked to evaluate ev evidence of critical, sorry, creative independent thinking. We're asked to evaluate the required scientific experience and capacity reflected in the track record reflected in the, the, this portion of the application, all that towards successfully executing the project. Again, all areas have their own standards and protocols. These are embedded in the individual areas of endeavor that uh, the committees that, uh, that one applies to through the ERC process. But I hope even as looking at the, how you represent yourself on the CV, you're thinking in terms of what's respected and understood in your discipline. Um, here's what I mean by that, just, just roughly. You know, in, in some areas of inquiry, monograph books are considered the pinnacle of research output. In others, it's peer reviewed articles. And in others yet, it's things like conference presentations and accompanying short papers, even preprints. You'll know your knowledge domain best and your reviewers will respond to, to that. Um, in some areas, a high teaching load and supervision load is a sign of researcher value and success. In others, it's quite the opposite. So too with things like administrative appointments and other sorts of things. You will know best how to represent yourself within the context of success in the ERC framework there in the context of your own discipline or interdiscipline. In some areas, last observation here, a successful research trajectory in this part of the application begins large scale at the outset and keeps going. In others, and certainly in my knowledge domain, it's more common to see work that begins small and iterates, slowly building in scale until it reaches uh, that, that much larger frontier scale. And, and that's a, a, a dominant uh, narrative for the, um, this portion of the application amongst those in my field for successful researchers. Um, in conclusion, just a minute, uh, this is a lot to think about, I know, and, and I'm rendering it specifically in this way, assuming that people have spent a lot of time in front of slides, and I really just wanted to, to speak generally. I'm here to answer questions in any way that makes most sense. Um, let me know. Um, summing up in a nutshell, all research will, will know their areas best and its standards, and these need to be reflected across all areas of the application, including the self-presentation of the second portion of the formal application. Researchers will also know how their proposed research fits best within this larger ERC mission and mandate and how it can be best situated to show the frontier nature. Uh, being explicit about this is really helpful, not only to those who share your knowledge domain expertise who are reviewing and evaluating, but also to those beyond who are a part of essential evaluative processes. Last but not least, Many institutions have research offices that can support research as they, researchers as they articulate proposed research in this context. And I would encourage you to be in touch if you have such an office with those who are there. They can not only provide a valuable sounding board um, and possibly even give a hand as you articulate some of your work in this context, they might even be able to provide access to past successful applications that can be used as models to your success. These are all valuable resources. Again, I'm happy to expand on any of the above, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you about this. Thank you so much, Dr. Siemens. I'll uh, briefly introduce our next speaker and just add a couple quick comments. Um, first and foremost, speaker uh, questions for the two speakers, please submit them via the Q&A uh, button that you should see towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's also a chat, a chat function if you need to let us know about any technical issues you may be experiencing, uh, but that Q&A window will be the best way for them to uh, see some questions and for me to read them. Uh, to them. I'll also mention that uh, during our previous ERC webinar two months ago, uh, there were still one or two grants that were that were open for the 2020 period. Uh, as of 
this current date, uh, the 2021 calls uh, have not been officially announced. I will put in the chat, however, the expected opening date for each grant. Uh, and if you're not watching this live and you're watching a recording, uh, I'll put those dates in the video description. Um, and again, please do submit any questions for, for our, our two great speakers uh, since they're here for us today. Uh, but after the webinar, really, I think your main points of contact will be us at Your Access North America and any relevant Your Access hub or office for you. Uh, as well as your country's uh, ERC national contact point. Uh, in Canada and the US, there is no ERC NCP. So basically I would direct you to the national contact point uh, for the European country you're interested in based on whatever university or research organization uh, you, you think you'd like to work with or, or work at. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Jeannet, uh, speaking from the grantee perspective. Uh, she is an ERC grantee and very recently uh, was on the other side, the applicant side of things. So thank you very much for your perspective, uh, Dr. Jeanne. Okay. Um, I hope everyone can uh, see my slide. I'm just gonna um, share my uh, screen with you. So what I wanted to share was my perspective as an applicant. Uh, I won the ERC starting grant in the 2019 um, uh, application process. So I applied in October 2018 and I was awarded the grant in uh, about August of 2019 and my project started in 2020. So um, I'm a sociologist. I applied to the SH3 panel, which is the social world panel. And um, the grant that I was awarded, it was at 1.1 million euros which lasts for five years. Um, the topic of my project, my project is called DESPO and it's called Deindustrializing Societies and the Political Consequences. And um, my project is basically about how when societies transition from manufacturing decline, how that affects the political behavior of its citizens. And it differs from the traditional approach, which tends to think that People who lose their jobs in manufacturing then tend to vote differently, et cetera. And I take a different approach um, by looking not at this idea of occupational exposure, but thinking about how manufacturing decline has changed family and community life and how that has changed political life. So it looks at these two alternative channels that were never looked at before, and it kind of goes against this uh, conventional wisdom of globalization, winners and losers, and tries to dig much further. And it spans 50 years. So it goes back from the 1960s into 2015. So it's not just a studying today, but it studies five decades of social change. So that's a little bit about my project. And I won't share too many details about my project because I would like to focus a bit more on the process. But if you have any questions about more about my project, I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, one thing I'd like to talk about, and uh, the place that I'll start, is uh, the timeline. One of the most common things that happens to me, because now people ask me for advice when they apply, is, you know, how long did you, did it take you to write the proposal? And if I were just simply to ask, to answer how long it took me to write the proposal, the answer is two months. But that is not how long it took me to prepare the project. So that's why I'd like to talk about how long it took me to prepare the project. I would say if in totality, it took me about two and a half years from beginning to work on the project to when I won the project. So it was not a short process. Um, and most of this time that I spent was not writing the proposal. It was thinking about the problem. Um, so I began in February of 2017 to think about designing a project with my ideas began to sort of germinate. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that process was. And for about nine months, I spent thinking about the question and the problem. And another nine months I spent thinking about how one could go about answering this problem. And by the time I sat down to write the proposal, I had everything clear in my mind. It was simply a matter of putting it on paper. And so I submitted and then um, in October, and I believe in about March or April, I found out that I had been selected for the interview. No, I'm sorry, it must have been a, yeah, May. And I had about a month, a month and a half to prepare for the interview, which I did in June. 
And then very soon after I, I found out that I won. Um, what I'm gonna do now is talk about each of these steps and how I went about it. Now, my, this is my path. I have no idea if this is the right path. This is the one that I took um, and it uh, was a successful application. I only applied once. So for me, it worked. Naturally, uh, I don't know how it works in other disciplines, but I, I hope that by sharing my path, you might at least get inspiration for yours. But this is not necessarily like a formula for success. It is simply what worked for me. Um, I'll first talk about the most important phase, which is coming up with an idea. This is the critical phase, in my opinion. It's the most important part, because if you don't have your idea, you've got not much to write. And when I speak with other researchers who are thinking about applying, what I tend to find is that people confuse a topic with an idea. So they might put together, you know, this area of research that not much has been done. And that's the topic, right? Like my friend, you know, might say, uh, not much has been done on, um, you know, unemployment in Iceland. Um, because, you know, things have been done about unemployment in, um, in Norway, but not much is known about unemployment in Iceland. And that's not gonna uh, cut it with, with as, as we know from what Ray explained. Thinking about a, a kind of topic where not much has been done isn't really the same thing as an idea. Uh, an idea is, uh, in my opinion, at least in my field in sociology, a new way of thinking about something, a new experience of unemployment, a new cause for unemployment, a new consequence for unemployment, a new concept, a new way of measuring it that doesn't capture an entire experience of, of unemployment that a person goes through, basically a, a new avenue for this. Um, and so I think it's really at least important, at least in the social sciences, that the idea is not, is not the topic. In the case of my research, for instance, the topic, the idea is not just that deindustrialization caused political change, like the kind of Rust Belt voters. It's the idea that changes in family and community life affected political behavior. That's the idea. Uh, manufacturing decline is the topic. I, I don't know if, if that's clear. I'm happy to elaborate a bit more. Um, so in order to get this idea, uh, I went through a long process in my idea generating phase of cross-pollination. And what I mean by cross-pollination is that I did a lot of reading um, outside of my own discipline or on the borders of my own discipline or outside of my field. I read in anthropology. I'm a quantitative researcher. I do data analysis, but I read a lot of ethnographies. Um, I went to a lot of seminars at my university that had really very little to do with what my field is. I went to economist seminars. I went to statistics seminars. I did all kinds of, sorry, I'm getting a lot too. Um, I did all kinds of attendance. Um, I didn't do it with the objective of coming up with an ERC ID, idea. It just was something that I did in general for my own pursuit of interest. And I, I started, to get bar started to borrow from them the kinds of data they used, the way that they uh, try to answer questions were different from the ones in my field. So I had all these new approaches kind of going around in my mind. And that's what I mean by cross pollination. Um, the third step is to marinate your mind. The reason that it took so long for me to come up with an idea was because you have to let things kind of sit like, like meat marinating. You know, you have, if, you have, if you know that tomorrow you have to write a proposal and come up with frontier research, you're just with that kind of time pressure, not going to come up with it, or at least not how I, how I am. I had to have let ideas kind of sit in my brain, think about them again, Think about how they related to my work, you know, ponder. It needed time to sink in. Um, and I think that's why the phase takes so long because it's not something you can just do under pressure. It has to really, you have to really actually ponder it uh, in day-to-day in, in -day -day scholarly life. Um, and the final step, in my opinion, is to exploit your own dissatisfaction. There were some questions in, that came up in, um, in sociology and political science, because I work at the intersection, I'm a political sociologist. And also reading the news a lot because it was around the time of the Trump and the Brexit moment uh, where there was this whole thing about the Rust Belt workers that were voting for Trump. I was simply not satisfied with the explanations that I read. I, I found them to be not, not satisfactory, not 
profound enough, not nuanced enough, too simplistic. The explanations that I found in my field, I, I, I had some burning questions in my mind about the question that burned in my mind, I remember was if, um, if democracies were created in parallel with industrialization and the industrial revolution, what happens to democracy when it deindustrializes? And this was this burning question that I had. And I tried to find the answer in my field and I couldn't find it. And the kinds of explanations I found were terribly unsatisfactory. And I exploited that, that, that I wasn't able to find an answer to something that I simply just wanted to know. I exploited that for the ERC idea. The second phase that I'd like to bring up is project development. Now this was different than, uh, than the project idea part. This was a part where I then took my main question, the question that I wanted to answer, the parts that I didn't, that I didn't find satisfactory in my field. And then I started to think about how I would want to answer it. One of the first things I did was find uh, untapped sources of data. So I began to find sources of data, which I felt could be an area which could answer this unanswered question. So in my mind, putting together a good proposal isn't just putting together a question, an original question, but it's also coming up with an original approach to answer the original question. So here's where I put my, some original thinking into the approach. So new sources of data, which were administrative data that hadn't been used in this way, I found a way to repurpose it. And I took the main question of the project and what I suggest to people oftentimes is to break it down into an issue tree. If you have one overarching question divided into three parts, three supporting questions, which together will help you all answer the overarching question. And for each of the three parts, how would you answer each part? So break it down into tangible, feasible parts, which you can then find solutions to, not just one solution for the overall question, because your project likely will have different parts because five years, it's not like writing one research paper, it's a five-year research program. And I found it extremely helpful to visualize and break down my project with a schema. I drew it out. I, I, I literally had a diagram with all the data for each of the parts, how they all fit together, how they all answered the main question. I did it for myself. And later I'll say, I did include a um, more simplified version in my proposal because I felt that the visual helped, but the visual in its essence was more for me. So by the time that I wrote my proposal, I already knew how all the pieces of this puzzle were gonna to fit together. The third uh, part that I would like to say is about proposal writing. Um, so this process was the quickest part of the process, it was two months. Uh, I suppose you would want to write for longer. I was forced to by the like, constraints of time, uh, probably six months, I think would probably be, be would have been better, but this was what I spent. Um, I first put my hands on past winning proposals in my, in my uh, panel. So in other sociological winning proposals. And you may not know people who have won, but you can write to them and they may share their proposals with you. They don't have to, but I get emails regularly, people asking me for my proposals and I, and I share them. I have no problem sharing them. So um, reading what good proposals that won look like was really helpful for me. I mean, just very simply, I didn't even know you could even bold words. So I read in some proposals, they would bold keywords to make them jump out from the page. I mean, just small tips like that. And also how they would sell their idea, how they packaged it was so helpful to see how they were writing so clearly. Um, I think Ray also said to write simply and jargon free. Of course, we all use jargon to social signal within our disciplines, but it may be read by somebody who's in a neighboring discipline. Like for instance, my proposal was read by anthropologists, although I'm a sociologist. And it may seem to some people in hard sciences that it's all the same, but it's really not. So um, uh, I tried to write it in a way that people outside the discipline, scholars of any kind could understand. Another thing is to grab attention. So yes, bolding some words. I remember I had this, um, I had a description of my database that my project would produce and a previous winner read my project and he said, no, you, 
put it in a box, make bullets and draw a box around this and what the contributions of this database are and dun, dun, dun. And then when, when you saw and you read the proposal, it was like, this project will contribute a unique database that is unique because, and then it said all the points which made it different and, and, and important. And it was in this box, which really made it jump out from the page. I also included a schema. Now, do I think that everybody who read my project understood my schema? Not necessarily, but it also demonstrated a kind of um, vision that I had that I myself as a PI had thought about how this all fit together and how all the pieces of the puzzle were gonna come together to answer the main question. And the last suggestion is to get feedback after you've written the proposal. I myself didn't have time to do this. Um, I wish I had. I, I got a little bit of feedback on the abstract, which actually worked out. I, was, I had to rewrite my first sentence many times. The first sentence is key. It, it, it grabs people. My first sentence, I guess somebody told me it was extremely boring. It was like, little research has been done on this. And so, so like, no, 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 no. You got to grab them with that first sentence. And so I think I spent like two days just writing this, rewriting that first sentence right up until the end of the submission. Um, I would like to spend the, the, the last few minutes to talk about timing of your submission. Um, some people, of course, I'm speaking about the starting grant. Um, so as we, as we know, there's this window of eligibility. Uh, so you can wait, I think up to seven years of after your PhD to submit. And some people really wait till the end of their eligibility criteria because they're gonna have such a great CV. Um, and when I applied, I, I didn't particularly have a very, or what I felt have a very competitive CV compared to people who were more advanced in their career. Uh, I mean, for instance, there are full professors who win um, uh, starting grants. I was only a postdoc. So just to give you an idea, I didn't was not particularly advanced. I was very young for the eligibility criteria. If you subtract out my children, I was about two years out of my PhD when I applied. So there were a lot of things I didn't have on my CV. I did not have the top articles in, the, in my discipline which would have been American Sociological Review or American Journal of Sociology, which are, let's say, signals of excellence in one's field. I didn't have that. But what I did have were single authored uh, uh, articles in very good journals, okay? So not the best, but written by myself, me alone, which is a signal of independence in, in my field. I did not have a long publishing record because I had just finished my PhD two years ago. I had a handful of articles, very few citations. I think when I applied, it's something like 22 citations, which of course all fields are different, but I, that's very little citations pretty much in any discipline. I mean, I had only just published three articles that year. So there had been not enough time to get citations. So I had a very low citation count. Um, but what I did have uh, was a, a PhD from the University of Oxford and, and postdoctoral positions at very reputable universities so I could demonstrate that I was well trained. I didn't have a tenure track position. Um, I was a postdoc, like I said, but I had a track record of funding. I had uh, won some postdoc funding. I had managed my own project and I had won a, a very small pot of money for a pilot project for the project. I mean, I had 10,000 euro for the pilot for this project, but I, it had paid me to have a research assistant. I had some preliminary results and it was feasible and it had tested the feasibility of, of the project. Um, but I'd like to share this uh, very honest uh, assessment of my CV because I feel that sometimes people don't apply for the ERC because they have the feeling that you have to be a superstar on your CV. And when I got the feedback from uh, from my panel when I won the grant, I saw that on my CV part, like the PI points part, I had been given very high points for creative independent thinking, which was obviously linked also to my proposal. Um, and so I was able, quite frankly, to win the grant really on the basis of my idea, having of course, uh, the decent training and, and a good record, a good CV, but it wasn't that I had an outstanding CV and a good idea. I had 
an excellent idea and a good CV. That's at least how I read my feedback um, and nonetheless was able to win. I'll just take two minutes uh, to, to wrap up and say one thing, um, which is, this is the backstage. So, you know, and I applied, seems like I spent all this time and really nice time thinking about my idea and everything seems so methodical and careful and clear and okay. But that's just simply not life. Um, this was, a, let's say, a very chaotic time in my life. It was certainly not the perfect time to apply. When I started the project development, I had a four month old at home. I came back from maternity leave. In the path during idea development and project cre creation, I, did, I applied to many research schemes. I was rejected from all of them. I put some here. UK ERSRC, the Swiss National Foundation was rejected twice, even in the resubmission I was rejected. This project was rejected everywhere. By the time I applied to the ERC, it was literally the only funding scheme to which I thought I could eligible to apply. It was my last shot. In the middle of all of these rejections, I gave birth to another child. And when I applied and submitted my application, it was two months coming back from my second maternity leave. And um, I share this with you, and <laughs> I remember I moved house a week before I submitted my application. I mean, it was really like craziness. Uh, it was not a perfect time to apply. I had not received tenure. I had received many rejections about my project, but I was just so desperate to get it funded, but not really for, um, by the end, there had been so many rejections I just simply felt that the project, I improved the project, of course, based on some feedback, but it, often I was given very little feedback about the rejections, but it just continued to improve it. And I just continued to believe it in it. And by the time I was called to Brussels and stood there, I've been thinking about this thing for more than two years. And I was just dying to get it funded and thought, if this thing doesn't get funded, it'll be such a shame uh, for also, because I felt like it was important. And I think that that came across somehow by the time I, uh, all that thinking and all that trying, I think, I think did get poured into the result. And it's certainly getting poured into the project as it is now. So I would like to share, uh, encourage people to apply, uh, even if the stars you know, are not perfectly aligned, if your idea is ripe and it's time to get this idea funded, to go for it and not wait for the perfect publication or the perfect CV or the perfect moment, because quite frankly, uh, life is, is like this. and, and uh, there's rejection along the way, but um, it, it, it never hurts to try. In my case, that was like that. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions about my path. And, and I thank you for listening to, to this, this story about what it was like for me. And I'll stop, stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Uh, so with, with the closing remarks on your side, we'll jump into a Q&A. Uh, I want to thank Ray as well, in particular, for during during your uh, part, Emory, answering a lot of the questions uh, via text here. Uh, I think between all of us, we're happy to type out some responses, but also uh, before we let everyone go, we're happy to sort of take some questions face to face, so to say, virtually. Um, and I would say if, if anyone sort of is on the fence about asking a question of, of our two speakers, uh, go ahead and ask now, since uh, after the webinar, I think your, your main points of contact will be the ERC uh, national contact points in the different European countries and then us at your Access North America. Uh, so this is a great final opportunity to get the perspectives from them. Um, and most of you, unless we individually sent a response and marked it as private, uh, you should be able to go in the Q&A uh, window and see our written responses uh, to some of the questions. So a lot of the questions so far have surrounded uh, statistics. I would say the ERC has been pretty great about compiling statistics, uh, not just percentages, but raw numbers, also dividing by domain and by country. Uh, so you can get an idea for how sort of in the numbers you might fit into things. Um, other than that, I, I will say we're happy to, to stay a few extra minutes, make sure that we take some, some live questions and uh, I'd encourage you to please submit those again via the, the Q&A window. Uh, as we wait for maybe some more ones to come in, I'm just gonna see if, if it makes sense to read off any of the existing questions. Um, so we will be sharing a recording of this after the fact, so feel free to review that. Uh, you should get a follow-up email from the Zoom platform uh, that I'll write and have sent to you tomorrow, about 24 hours from now. Um, Let's see. 
So based on a lot of the questions surrounding dates and statistics, I, I in the answered questions in the chat, I did share a list of open and closed dates based on the 2020 work program for the ERC grants uh, that, that lists the call open and closed dates from the current year, which is now all of those uh, calls are closed. Uh, you can sort of use your, your common sense and see what the time length is and estimate when they would close this year based on the projected estimated opening dates, but none of this is official. Uh, there's still negotiations going on for the funding of the next uh, research and innovation framework program. Uh, so for those who have attended other year access webinars, you're well familiar with the fact that uh, the European Commission's research and innovation uh, efforts are under seven year framework programs uh, and basically funding schemes. So December 31st of this year is the end of the current seven year program, Horizon 2020. And January 1st is when Horizon Europe opens, uh, but the budget for that is still being negotiated and finalized. So in that case, uh, the ERC and other similar funding schemes from the European Commission uh, don't necessarily have fi completely finalized official open dates. Uh, that said, a large majority of the call dates are projected to open in mid-January. And I did put in the chat uh, those, those specific estimated dates. Uh, so I think I see a small number of questions coming in. I would encourage um, Ray and Anne-Marie to see if there's any that they can they can speak to. I'll also see if there's anything from your access perspective I can speak to. So in terms of uh, ERC grants being similar uh, to NIH grants, uh, I'll be happy to connect with the person asking this question a bit more one-on-one -on -one after the fact. I would say it's also possible, depending on what you're interested in, into looking at the implementing arrangements. So the bilateral agreement between the US and the European Commission uh, regarding funding when you bring together uh, US and, and European uh, research sources. So that, that may be something we can connect with offline. And I'm not sure, um, Anne-Marie and Ray, if, if there's anything else that I think is pending that we can answer. There's just a question about um about uh, supporting a research collaboration between the US research universe institution and the European Union. It may be that the synergy grant uh, is, uh, allows a cross institutional collaboration, but generally the other three, which is the starting consular and advanced go to the PI. And I think that they have to be based at a European university, but I'll let somebody else clarify that. But that's my, that, that's, I think that's the instrument, the synergy grant. But it is, I think, the most competitive one. So I kind of have to weigh whether it's appropriate or not. Nobel Prize winners win that one. <laughs> OK, so we have uh, a hand raised. I think we're going to experiment here and see if uh, this person would like to share his question live. So if you want to unmute yourself, I'm now allowing to talk the person with the, the raised hand here. And other than that, we'll, we'll try to take one or two questions uh, via the submitted Q&A window. So Sradka, if you want to unmute yourself, you should be uh, able to unmute yourself here and share a question with us. Other than that, we'll, we'll begin to close out soon. I, I want to keep to the promised timeline here. Um, again, a lot of the, the answered questions that we've, we've written out responses for uh, should be viewable by all audience members. There's a question in the chat about tips in the interview. Um, I'll just say that um, I would, a uh, very, very small percentage of applicants are invited to the interview. So it wouldn't make sense to prepare for the interview until you've been invited. And then um, if, you're can, if you are invited to the interview, I'm happy to share my, my, tips, my tips with you. But I think the most important thing is first getting the interview. Just building on, on what Anne-Marie has said, um, those who are invited to the interview have a number of things to say about it. But you know, most commonly what I've heard is how excited they are. And, and that is one of the key things in addition to domain area expertise and an understanding of how your project fits within the ERC mission and mandate and how it's frontier research, but, but conveying that excitement is a, a key and essential component of talking with real live people about something you care about. Um, it is really one of the most exciting parts of the whole process. 
Yeah, I might add to the uh, point that when I applied, my goal was not to win, but to get invited to the interview because being invited, even if you don't win, is a great honor. So it's a great place to start is just say, okay, this would be an ultimate success if I'm invited because I'll be amongst the top. And then when you're invited, it's really kind of like a mix of chance and, and you only have seven minutes to talk, or at least I only had seven minutes to talk. So don't spend all that time worrying about those seven minutes until you have to get there. But I think as a first step to be amongst those selected for the interview is already a, a great achievement and, and then go from there. Yeah, it's a pretty rigid process. Well, uh, ensuring that everyone is evaluated equally and has the same opportunity to connect. Um, you know, Anne Marie, I, I really enjoyed everything you said about your process. Not not the part about hardship, but you know, human experience. I think is the phrase you used a couple times, and I really appreciated the way that you conveyed that that lived experience because I think it's something that's shared by everyone who applies because we're all human, living life in real. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to thank you for sharing that part of it as well. Thank you. I think, I hope it encourages some people who are shy to apply that maybe would take themselves out of the running for, for other reasons. I think that's a, a great remark to start to close on. I'll ask the speakers maybe do a quick once over of, of the pending questions. I think a lot of the, there's a small number of questions that may be best answered by uh, ERC NCPs uh, or staff members. So I'll be happy to, to connect those pending questions, uh, connect with you one-on-one, -on -one, send us an email and I, I've recorded the questions here. Uh, to hopefully get them them answered um, from an official point of view. Uh, but other than that, I'd just like to thank you all for attending and thank our, our speakers uh, for the really interesting perspectives that will hopefully prepare the next round of ERC uh, grant applications. Thank you so much.